bear market full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that i expect talk to me about inflation because you know i was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit you know i remember being just a kid hearing about double digit inflation i could kind of remember the gas pumps you know the lines at the gas it's like a distant memory of me in the 70s and but you know how do you talk to younger people these days about what inflation is or it means because i don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an even a medium term that's exactly right brian and if you um you're a little younger than i am but i lived through it i was started my career in banking in 1976 and i remember my uh, my wife and i used to kid each other she was in advertising i was in banking and the inflation was so bad you'd get a raise every like 4 or 5 months and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you cuz they knew that you were going to quit if they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and then i would get a raise and i was making more than she was so we would just tease each other about that but that's how it was and the psychology was you know if you needed a whatever you know a tv set or refrigerator new car or whatever you say i better buy it now because the price is going to be higher if i wait a month or two months the price is going to run away from me so it had huge behavioral effects of course gold was you know going to the moon there was a lot going on at the time but Brian you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years that is correct a little 41 actually it was 1981 before we saw these numbers but i remind people the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10 year period of inflation it wasn't the beginning it's like oh that's an in inflation i didn't know yeah we did but it had started i mean some ways it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974 75 so 81 these numbers that was when volcker finally got it under control but you go back to 80 now 70 we do well between 77 and 81 so that five year period the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power not 15 50 in that five year stretch so you were putting up numbers you know 10% 11% 13% and higher year after year yeah 1981 it was um you know 9 or 10 which is what they're comparing to today but that was on the downslope it had been higher than that in 77 78 and you know 79 so the question is is this the beginning of an inflationary surge or it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years or is it different than that but keep that in mind because the 40 year comparison it is correct but that was the tail end of an even worse episode and again there is this comparison to the 70s by the way i think the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s and i'll explain why in the 70s it was triggered from the supply side with first the arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the uh, the 1973 arab israeli war and then the price tripled but it went from like $2 to $6 okay but you know percentage terms that's a huge jump but it was still $6 and then it got to 12 and then in 1979 you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that and then it went from kind of 12 to 20 so oil went up by a factor of 10 in the course of the late 70s because of those two different embargoes so that's coming from the supply side but what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side so you have what's called cost push inflation that's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage of natural disaster a lot of things is coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic so you just pay up or you know kind of do without but the demand side is much more psychological that's called demand pull inflation that's when consumers behave the way i described and as i said lived through the 70s um where you know hey i better buy it today i better buy it now you're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse So as that applies to today we are starting with the cost push inflation you know, mainly the price of energy but the price of food is a big factor and of course they're related you know it's like here's the energy here's the food you know where do you think the food comes from to get the food you got to feed the pigs and cows what do you feed them you feed them corn oh, how do you get corn well you grow it on a farm you need nitrogen fertilizer you need diesel in your tractors you get the food you got to put it in a truck to get it from point a to point b that requires diesel the higher the diesel price the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck etc so these things as i say are linked but food prices are going up substantially and you can't the two things you can't do without like 
I spent a lot of time on the Fed. And the question is, okay, what about June? They got, you know, six more meetings this year. So here's the Fed's dilemma, and it, it's playing out in real time. So Jay Powell gave, I lost count, seven or eight speeches, and they said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're on a path to raise interest rates. We're not going to quit until inflation is under control. Now, there's a little wiggle room around that. Their target is two. They actually look at personal consumption expenditure year over year, core. That's their metric. There are 15 ways to measure inflation, but that's the one they like. But even that is still over close to five. It's a long way from two. That's the point. You're trying to get to two. They're a long way from two. But there's something called the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? Well, no one knows the number. I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. So we're all estimating. But um, the terminal rate, it's a rate that's high enough to bring down inflation on its own without further rate hikes. Knows we can stop here and confident that inflation is going to come down without doing more. Because the conundrum is, okay, they've been raising rates since March 2022. Monetary policy works with a lag. Inflation peaked in July 2022, and it has been coming down ever since. You know, some of the some months were, you know, January was hot compared to December, but the trend has been down. So they're raising rates and inflation is coming down. So that's good. But here's what they don't know. Was inflation coming down because they were raising rates or had they already hit the terminal rate and they just didn't know it? Because Wall Street was like, no, you've hit the terminal rate. Stop, please stop. You got this under control. The Fed doesn't believe that. One of the greatest blunders in monetary policy was Paul Volcker in 1980, who had started raising rates in 1979 and inflation was coming down. But then in 1980, we had a very sharp recession that had nothing to do with monetary policy. It wasn't caused by Paul Volcker. Jimmy Carter put a cap on credit card interest and everyone banks stopped issuing credit cards. Well, that'll that'll sink the economy. And then so Volcker reacted to that by lowering interest rates seven percentage points, not 70 basis points, seven percentage points, because we're in a recession, right? That's what feds do, the Fed chairs do. But because it was a regulatory blunder, they fixed it and the economy came roaring back. And then inflation really took off worse than when Volcker got in in 79, early 1980. So Volcker had to take rates to 20% to get inflation under control the second time after cutting them in 1980. And that's called the Volcker mistake or the Volcker blunder. And Volcker himself, I spoke to him, he said, yeah, that was that was a mistake that I should have stuck. I should have stuck to my program, not worried about the economy and unemployment, but just got inflation under control. But when he threw in the towel prematurely, the inflation went to the moon. Jay Powell doesn't want to be that guy. Jay Powell knows that episode as well as I do. And he doesn't want to be the guy who throws in the towel early and then inflation just goes to the moon and then he's got it. Then he has to take interest rates to 15 percent or something ridiculous. So Wall Street's saying you're already there. Mission accomplished. Powell's saying not so fast. They told Volcker that and he cut rates and it was an enormous mistake. So Powell's not going to be that guy. So what is the terminal rate today? I would say five and a half because we had had a lot of hot data, you know, unemployment down, uh, job creation up, retail sales up, not to the moon, but these are the opposite of what Powell is looking for. So he's had no confirmation that inflation is coming down on his own. He's had a lot of data that says inflation may be getting ready to take off again. So you got to say the terminal rate went from five and a quarter to five and a half, maybe more. Let's you know see what he does in June. And Powell always said, I don't care if there's a recession. I don't care if there's unemployment because the long-term costs of inflation are going to be much greater than those short-term problems. We got to suffer through that to get a bigger problem under control. He thinks of inflation. He said this many, many times. Now, along comes Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Oh, by the way, in addition to raising rates, don't forget QT, quantitative tightening. They were shrinking their balance sheet. It's very hard to estimate the monetary impact of shrinking the balance sheet, but the best estimate is for every trillion dollars you take it down, it's probably equal to a one percentage point hike in the Fed funds rate. So the tightening has been more than just taking the Fed funds rate up. You also have to take into account QT. Now let's go back to the, the bond, the bond guarantee and bailing out the entire banking system. The Fed proceeded to guarantee every deposit and every bank in the entire U.S. banking system. Here we're talking, you know, six or seven trillion dollars of assets. And the way they did it was um, a lot of other banks, you know, big ones and small ones, at least the big ones that had good risk management, but a lot of small and medium-sized banks, they had the same problem Silicon Valley Bank had. Maybe the depositors weren't work, walking out the door, or maybe they weren't funding tech startups, but they had underwater bonds and overnight deposits and were facing the same thing. So the Fed said, Okay, all you banks, if you send us your bonds, we'll give you cash. Okay, that's just a normal discount operation. But 
that will give you cash equivalent to the par value. So again, remember the market value is like 80 cents on the dollar, but the Fed says we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar. So now you ship your bonds to the Fed, they give you not 100%, which is like low collateral, but they give you 120%. So the banks are shipping in bonds that are worth 80 cents on the dollar. Why wouldn't you do that? I'm like, hey, hey, Fed, if you want to give me a low, low interest rate bridge loan uh, with 80% down, I'll take all you got. So now the banks are going to are going to do that. And by the way, there's no because it's structured kind of like a repurchase agreement. There's no sale, so they don't have to market to market. If you sold it to a third party, a dealer, you would. You'd have to take the loss, but now they don't have to take the loss. So they're shipping in billions, potentially a trillion dollars or more of these bonds. They're not getting 80, 90 cents on the dollar, which is what they're worth. They're getting 100 cents on the dollar, which was the original purchase price. They don't have to take the loss and they're getting cash. Why wouldn't you do that all day long? So in effect, they bailed out the entire banking system to the tune of trillions of dollars. They just blew up the $250,000 limit. Forget that. I mean, I know what the statute says, but they threw that out the window. And uh, the, the moral hazard, the economic consequences, the repercussions of this are kind of unimaginable. I mean, I can sketch them. I can talk about them. You know, to hear Johnny Hill say it's not a bailout. Are you kidding me? This is the biggest bailout in history. And I, you know, I, I negotiated the LTCM bailout. I, I lived through that. That was a trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and through 2008, 2020, the pandemic, I go back to 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. I've, I've lived through all these and been more or less directly involved in all of them. And this is orders of magnitude greater in terms of what's being bailed out. Doesn't that mean that a lot of banks will be sending the bonds to the Fed and getting cash? Yes, yeah, exactly what it means. Well, where's the cash come from? You got to print it. So on the one hand, we're doing quantitative tightening by letting bonds mature and not reinvesting. But on the other hand, you just send an open invitation, open party, house party to every bank in the country saying, send us your bonds and we'll give you cash. Not only that, but 100 cents on the dollar, even if they're worth 80. So, so you're going to have potentially trillions of dollars of new money being printed at a time when the Fed's trying to get inflation under control and they were trying to shrink the balance sheet. They're going to be expanding the balance sheet. So, I mean, there's no way out. There's no good way out of this. You can pause. Uh, I don't think they will, but you could pause and not raise rates, right? And implicitly saying we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future because we got all these losses in the banks. Okay, inflation goes to the moon. I promise you it'll just take off like a rocket. Or you can raise interest rates 25 basis points and we'll continue this war on inflation, but you're just going to increase the bond losses in the banks and make them send you more bonds and get more cash. Or the third thing is just take away the, the umbrella and let all these banks fail. I mean, it's like name your poison, name your poison. You can have runaway inflation, severe acute banking crisis, or basically a lot more, as I say, a lot more bank failures uh, and, and a severe recession because you're going to keep raising rates. There are three choices, but none of them are good. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's objective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates? Or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So my expectation is the Fed will raise interest rates 25 basis points in March. March 22nd is the Fed meeting after that. Well, that gets you to five and a quarter. And even the hawk, more hawkish members think that that's probably the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff, I mean, the Fed's thinking mid-2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street, and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, 
you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause, going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20% or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15% uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time... When farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building and one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That, I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which, number one, was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that. You know, looking at both sides, Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time, that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder. He never should have done it. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year. There are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then... COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. 
but it really started before that. So of course prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to, to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. And basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. But here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand, and hurt the economy. Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. When you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the rupee aren't going to replace anything. Well, the repercussions may be felt for 10 years or longer, uh, but the the, uh, the immediate impact is going to go well beyond um, uh, you know the so-called sanctions. What the point I was really making was we're slapping sanctions on Russia. Russia is hitting back with some retaliatory actions, uh, and it's pretty easy to, to look at the direct impact of that, but there's second order and third order effects that will pop up all over the world and could very quickly get out of control. I think of it as the economic equivalent of a nuclear war. Nobody wants a nuclear war. But the, they, the, the one thing they all said in common, the one thing they all shared was, don't go there. And what they meant was that nobody wakes up and says, oh, gee, I think I'll start a nuclear war today. What a good idea. That, that never happens. What does happen is you get into an escalatory situation, back and forth and back and forth, where you're escalating and escalating, and you end up in a nuclear war. You never intended it, never started out that way, but you end up there through escalation. Now take that, and that, that, that is good analysis, take that and apply it to what is now, I would say, the first full-scale economic war, uh, sanctions war. We've had sanctions you know, for a long time, and we go back to the at least the 70s with, with Iran, but even before that, I mean, FDR put sanctions on Japan. Nothing on this scale. This is uh, unprecedented in its scope and application. Uh, and my only point is it, it, the effects of this are going to not just last a long time, yes, but they're going to pop up in very, very unexpected places. Um, I, I did. It, uh, let me make the, let me make the point. This was uh, there was never a war that was easier to prevent. There was, there's never been a war that's easier to prevent 
and there's never been a war that's easier to end. Uh, the, you could end this war in 48 hours or less. Uh, having said that, I did expect that through a series of policy blunders and escalation, in this case, military escalation and political escalation, and then later in the book, around on page 250 or so, I have a whole section on Ukraine, Russia, and natural gas. So this has been brewing for a long time. Um, you can go back to the 2008 Bucharest Declaration, but if you, if you want to pick one thing and say, hey, when, when did this thing take a turn for the worse right. so that we were on a path to war? That was the color revolution sponsored by Obama and Biden, um, which was a coup d'etat. I mean, the, the president of Ukraine at the time, he was pro-Russian, and Obama set out to depose him, and they did. And they put in Poroshenko, who was a U.S. puppet, and at the same time, like a month, well, two months after the color revolution, one month before Poroshenko, uh, Putin took Crimea. He said, okay, that's how you want to play, fine. Uh, you, throw, you move away from neutrality, move towards NATO, NATO, I'll take Crimea, your move. And then there was nothing, to, Putin didn't take one square inch during the Trump administration, because Trump is, Trump is highly unpredictable, but put Biden back in, who was part of the original Obama-Biden team. And so not only was Trump not in Putin's pocket, uh, he was the only one who stood up to Putin in such a way that Putin didn't take one square inch of territory. He took Crimea under Obama. Now he's taking kind of half the country under Biden. Didn't take anything under Trump. So that completely debunks that. But just to take it one step further, who is in the pocket of, um, of, the, of the Ukrainians, at least? And the answer is Joe Biden, because of Hunter Biden, who made millions of dollars from Burisma, their large natural gas company. Ukraine is ranked... Uh, in the low 90s of the of the most corrupt countries in the world. In other words, the it's at the bottom on a corruption list with the best with the, with the most honest countries being on top. Um, Ukraine is very close to the bottom. It's it's the most corrupt country in Europe, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Zelensky is just another oligarch, just another phony. Uh, now you can take sides, but to me, Putin's a dictator. Zelensky is a dictator. You know, pick your dictator. But um, this idea that he's some you know, good guy Democrat is nonsense. Well, it's a phone call, basically. I mean, Biden, uh, Biden's kind of non compass mentis, but somebody with, uh, who can you know, string a few sentences together needs to call Zelensky and say, um, here's what we're going to do. You, you're not going to join NATO. Well, we'll get the, the NATO Secretary General, John, John Stoltenberg, uh, to say that. You need to say it. The U.S. will say it. So you're not going to join NATO. You're not going to join the EU. You can be independent in the sense of being autonomous, but you have to be neutral. When, when you've got two great powers, whether it's the U.S. and Russia or um, the U.S. plus Europe and Russia confronting each other, uh, the idea of buffer states, I mean, that's as old as, uh, you know, the, 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 if not history, uh, at least the, the history of buffer states is uh, several centuries old at this point. It's, it's a part of what every international uh, strategist uh, looks at. So Ukraine should be a buffer state, it should be neutral. Uh, that way Putin has no reason to invade and we have no reason to try to push the borders of NATO to a point slightly east of Moscow, which uh, Moscow hasn't been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan. These sanctions will not work to stop the war or slow the war or change the outcome of the war. Now, they absolutely punish the Russian economy, yep. They punish Russian individuals, consumers, Russian citizens, they're gonna have fewer options, uh, more expensive goods, um, you know, their economy is going to slow down, unemployment will go up, the ruble is devalued. All those things are true, but they're also true in the United States. We're going to punish Americans far worse than the Russians. Uh, we're already seeing, I took a long trip yesterday, uh, I filled up my car with gas at the end of the trip, it was $76. Inflation's here, uh, we all see it. Uh, you know, price of gasoline, uh, eggs, milk, butter, groceries at the store. Um, rents, electricity, uh, home heating, uh, you know, fuel, uh, you name it, across the board, inflation is affecting everything. Um, and it started uh, really in uh, mid-2021, so here we are, uh, almost 2023, so it's been going on for well over a year. Uh, for the first six or seven months, you know, Jay Powell and for that matter, Janet Yellen were like, yeah, we see it, but it's transitory, transitory. We know that story. Finally, November 2021, Jay Powell threw in the towel, uh, said, okay, time time to retire the word transitory. Now let's get to work. And they um, started raising interest rates in uh, March 2022. And we're now up to uh, Fed funds rate of 4%. 
Uh, they're going to raise them again in December, uh, December 14th by another 50 basis points. We kind of, you know, still a little bit away from that, but we know it's coming. The Fed, this is the no drama Fed. They tell you what they're doing in advance. So uh, I always say you don't you don't need a crystal ball to figure out the Fed. You just need to listen to what they're saying and believe them. So they're, they're going to do 50 basis points in uh, December. That'll get the um, uh, policy rate of the Fed funds uh, target rate to four and a half percent. But that's from zero. March 1st, it was zero. So to go from zero to four and a half in less than nine months, uh, about eight and a half months, that's amazing. We haven't seen anything like that since uh, uh, Paul Volcker in, in the early 80s. Now, I know rates are not 13, 14 percent, but um, but to go from zero to four and a half, I can say in eight months is uh, is a shock. Now, what's why is the Fed doing this? Well, they, they say they want to kill inflation. OK, but. Um, there are two sources of inflation. Inflation can come from the supply side, um, what's called cost push inflation. Costs go up and they get pushed into um, uh, you know, re retail prices and, and consumer prices. Uh, and that is what's happening. That's because of the supply chain breakdown, energy uh, prices, shortages of goods, et cetera. So that's cost push inflation from the supply side. There's another kind of inflation that comes from the demand side. And this is much more psychological. It's when consumers say, you know, they just have it in their heads and maybe from objective data that prices are going up. And so they change their behavior. They say, you know, I was thinking of getting a new washing machine, but uh, I was going to wait six months, but I better buy it now because the price is going to be a lot higher in six months or a car, or, you know, suit of clothes, a dress, a furniture, whatever it is, better buy it now because the price is going to go up. It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year Treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, or you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So, what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971. And I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged to $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. With the United States and sterling, I think it was four seventy-five. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four four pounds and and change. And as late as World War One, say nineteen thirteen, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of the British sovereigns. The British sovereign is is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much, even even today. What are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time 
and it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing as Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan are all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971 when we decouple completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold. Um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK, or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank. And they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made four hundred ounce bars. And they said, Don't worry, your money's backed by the gold. But keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh by the way, they're four hundred ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a four hundred ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy. They weigh about thirty five pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the nineteen thirties. The central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first, the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. And the Federal Reserve System told all the banks, hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold. But people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three... Uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and, you know, hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And it's there. And look on the, look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that $11 billion is actually worth $470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of $450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold. The Treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money. But of course, it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I'm just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics, and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hid it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. 
the British sold more than half. No, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold a thousand tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a you know a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., "Hey, why don't you sell some of your gold?" But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it an ounce since 1980. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is two percent. So he's he's not there, but he's making progress. Now Wall Street's saying. You're done. You, you you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want. Give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates, or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying: the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate; that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, "Yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, and then we'll pause. And then, if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street, and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like、uh, the Eurodollar futures curve and and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying no. You're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think,、uh, and rates are going to have to come down、uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it, and you'll probably be the last to know. So, with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the、um, early to mid 80s,、uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20 percent, or very close to it, to kill inflation, which went up to 15 percent、uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates, and the industry said, "Fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money." The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the、uh, pandemic panic.、Uh, and then they said, "Oh, sorry, just kidding." And then and then、uh, they took the ceiling off, and then things got back to normal. Now this was a time. When farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington, and they were circling the Fed building, and one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed, and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So、uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms, and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker,、uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not point seven, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by. A, a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected, and number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates, and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse, and that's when Volcker had to raise rates to twenty percent. And Volcker, in hindsight, he, he said, we, "We shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission." So now, Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist; he's a lawyer, so he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that. You know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won, because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981, 82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder. He never should have done it. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy, and that's what's driving him. Even as Wall Street screams, "You're already there." So, so the question is, how does this play out? 
in my view, Hal probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest, the unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed and energy prices were a big driver of that so that feeds through as a form of inflation the other kind of inflation is from the demand side so the supply side is called cost push costs go up and they push it onto the consumers the other kind is from the demand side it's called demand pull and basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. But here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. And then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still he's fighting the last war. I hate to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker war. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle's not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there. Well, the future is very positive for gold. Uh, you have the normal vectors. You know, uh, supply is flat, but has been for six years. Demand is going up. Central banks have flipped from net sellers to net buyers. That's a big deal. Um, and retail and institutional interest is higher. So that's good. Geopolitical threats don't need to say a lot. You know, from the U.S. perspective, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, you name it. So that's the vector. But the biggest driver right now is what I referred to a few minutes ago, negative real rates. Because gold as a form of money, which is how I view it, competes with other interest rate, com competes with other instruments, treasury bills, et cetera. Well, if they have high yields and gold has no yield, you want the treasury bills. But if uh, if interest rates have negative yields and gold's just flat, gold looks more attractive. So that's the main driver and that's going to continue. Everyone's like, well, you know, the gold is up, gold is down. Uh, but when that, so what do you mean when you say that? And they're talking about the dollar price of gold. And it's like, okay, so the dollar price of gold is up or down. 
that's really a cross rate. That's so different than talking about the Euro US dollar exchange rate or, or Australian dollar US dollar exchange rate. If you think of gold as money, and I do, then the dollar price of gold with gold measured by weight, not as another currency, uh, it is another form of money, but with gold measured by weight, it's a cross exchange rate. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone says gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numerator. The numerator is your counting system, you know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever. And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. And so when you say gold is going up, let's say it went to $2,000 an ounce. It was, oh, the price of gold went up, you know, just went up uh, 10%. Um, well, did it or did the dollar go down? Uh, the way I would phrase it is, you know, it used to be $1,800 to get an ounce of gold. Now it's $2,000 to get an ounce of gold or, you know, your dollar got you one eighteen hundredth of an ounce. Today, it only gets you one two thousandth of an ounce. Uh, in other words, gold didn't do anything. It's a metal. It's an element, atomic number 79. What happened was the, the dollar got stronger. So a stronger dollar is a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar is a higher dollar price for gold. So when people talk about gold going up, what they're really talking about is the dollar going down. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. Now, now China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons, US was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one. Literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons well you know the market you, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month not not one country in one order but they had it all along but they decided to reveal it put it on their balance sheet so uh americans don't seem to like gold i'm not sure canadians feel much differently or others around the world uh but central banks sure do and i think that tells you something there's huge demand for dollars all over the world not because of the currency but because of collateral because of treasury bills Banks need treasury bills to pledge as collateral for derivatives. It's the best collateral in the world. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to leverage your balance sheet as much as you would like. You're not going to be as profitable. You're not going to be able to support lending and investing, which is what banks in theory are supposed to do. So to support the bloated balance sheets and to support the derivatives, you need collateral. And the better the collateral, the more leverage you can have. The best collateral in the world is a treasury bill. And so there's a mad scramble for treasury bills, which means there's a mad scramble for dollars to buy treasury bills. And that is coming from European banks. It's coming from Chinese banks um, and banks around the world, but primarily European and Chinese. And that's not going away. So it's, it's, it's funny to hear people, or people think it's funny to hear 
And you want to talk about a dollar collateral shortage, like, hey, haven't you flooded the world with dollars? Hasn't the Fed printed $9 trillion? And the answer is they have. But that's not the measure. It's, it's, a, it's a high multiple of that. It's the dollar value of all the collateral. Because in the repo markets, you know, I pledge the collateral to you, and then you pledge it to somebody else, one of our colleagues, and then she pledges it to somebody else, et cetera. That collateral gets pledged 50 times and supports not one dollar a balance sheet but fifty dollars a balance sheet for a dollar of collateral and so you restrict the collateral you're restricting the balance sheet the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight but as a payment currency there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency anything can be a payment currency if i want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that then it's a it's a currency so all of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. I can give you 20 reasons why the dollar should go down, but I'll give you one big reason why it won't, which is the demand for collateral. And so that's keeping the dollar constant, which is keeping the dollar price of gold constant because gold doesn't change and the dollar's not changing. Now that'll break um, and that'll break in favor of gold, meaning the dollar will get a lot weaker. It'll have to, but it's gonna take a few months at least because the US economy has to get weaker, which it is. The Fed will figure this out maybe by September, like next September. Um, and uh, then they'll ease a little bit and they'll try to weaken the dollar to try to give the U.S. economy a boost, but we're not there yet. So it's going to be, now that doesn't mean the price of gold is going down a lot. I'm just saying it's not going to go up a lot. It's going to chug along kind of sideways, but when it breaks, it's going to break big to the upside because the dollar is going to go to the downside, but that's probably at least um, still a few months away, maybe longer. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year. Records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously the theories are that, our, that, are, that they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. Now, now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons. The U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world, uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is going to come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major U.S. recession in 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's going to be worse than they think. And then they ramp up the printing press again, Jim. Yes, but it doesn't work. You know, uh, $9 trillion of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as extra reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. 
they're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is you know Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor, as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone says gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say gold's really going down, I said, no, the dollar's worth more, and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numerator. The numerator is your counting system, you know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever. And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. In 1914, when World War I started, all the major powers went off the gold standard. They said, we've got to keep our gold. This is real money, and this is how we're going to win the war. And the Bank of England was faced, uh, and the Exchequer was faced with the same choice. Keynes was an advisor to the Exchequer. He said, don't go off the gold standard. Stay on the gold standard. And the reason was that if you did that, you would preserve your reputation and preserve your credit. He said, the, the war is not going to be won with money or gold. It's going to be won with credit. But if you stay on the gold standard, you'll have the credit. And that's exactly what happened. Pierpont Morgan, or sorry, Jack Morgan, uh, Pierpont's son, uh, organized huge loans for England and France and nothing for Germany. And England won the war. So the point is, Keynes got that right. Now, flash forward, 1925, he's talking to Churchill, and Churchill wants to go back to the gold standard. And Keynes is telling him, you got the price wrong. You know, we can't go back at, you know, four pounds, 25, or whatever the exact rate was. Um, we've got to devalue the sterling by half because we doubled the money supply to fight the war. Churchill ignored Keynes' advice and um, and they went into a recession, depression before the rest of the world. Flash forward 1944, you're at Bretton Woods. Keynes wanted a gold standard. And this isn't speculation. He wrote papers. He gave formal presentations. So 1914 is pro-gold. 1925, he's telling Churchill, you're nuts. You can't go back to a gold standard at this price. 1944, he's pro-gold again. I call that a pragmatist. Inflation, yeah, prices go up. So we understand that or Maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, has, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. And we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Uh, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, because of the price of oil, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. The other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s and it just spun out of control and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side. Some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported. So fuel is part of everything. It gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and, uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, 
eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral and that is really hard to, to change. If we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and, you know, uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call. I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data. Uh, and it's a very, very troubling sign, last seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you gonna drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? But I found some really, really interesting research that because uh, everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S. China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well. That's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil, all of a sudden you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we started selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships. Economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened, and for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over, like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery, and they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. <laughs> Debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half, maybe that's continuing. Um, People talk unemployment close to an all-time low. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s, and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working. Um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old. It's never 100. I mean, there's always, you could be um, a homemaker, a, a student, um, they're, they're uh, retired, early retirees. There are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce, but not you know, taking 10% off or 14% decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's, uh, so if you, if you throw those people into the, un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is, a recession or depression level actually um you know the baseline deficit is a trillion so your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control i don't want to overuse metaphors but one metaphor is you have a very beautiful expensive vase and somebody knocks it over and it breaks into five thousand pieces 
you can't put the vase back together. You've got to go get a new one. And that's what's happened with the supply chain. The, what I call supply chain 1.0 from 1989 to 2019 is broken. Uh, there will be a new supply chain. There always are. Supply chains have been around since the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the new supply chain, what I call supply chain 2.0, will look very different than the old supply chain. Right now, we're in an in-between period where things don't work well. Uh, again, it doesn't mean total chaos, but you know, you still see shortages. You still see higher prices, which are coming from supply chain disruptions. Um, and these things are not easy to fix, but they can be replaced. And that's what I expect to happen. We'll hear from them at some point, but we're in a recession now and people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, it, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which you know don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think, here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number, but uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. Around November 2021, you'll recall there were headlines, you know, bare shelves, empty shelves, supply chain breakdown, you know, Christmas will be canceled, et cetera. And it was all true. You you went to the supermarket. It didn't mean that every shelf was completely bare, like uh, you know East Germany in the 1950s. But there, you know, paper goods might not be there, or maybe your favorite kind of tomato sauce, or or you know chicken or whatever it was. There were some things there, but a lot of things weren't there, and that got worse. And then, of course, because uh, uh, gas prices skyrocketed uh, because of um, uh, basically because of a lot of bad policy from uh, from the United States in terms of Keystone Pipeline and a lot of other factors. That then. You Know, got worse. It eased up a little bit in the summer, but it never went away. This is a complex system. It was breaking down. That was very. Inflation, uh, nominally, yeah, prices are going up. Okay, so that's inflation. But it can come from two sources that are opposite. One is from uh, supply side shocks, supply chain disruption. We saw that in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo over the Arab Israeli war at the time, the price of oil quadrupled, etc. That was a supply shock. The thing about supply side inflation is it's self negating. It burns itself out. So, you know, the old uh, saying, and it's true, the, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, when things get too expensive because of supply disruption, people can't afford them, businesses close, you get layoffs, you go into recession, and prices come down pretty quickly after that. The other source of inflation is from the demand side. And this is a completely different dynamic. We saw this in the late 70s, where um, uh, you know prices are going up, but people have some bargaining power. So unions are on strike, they're getting higher wages. Uh, I mean, I worked at Citibank in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. So the supply side disruption tends to snuff itself out. The demand side inflation tends to feed on itself, it gets out of control. And then we saw what Paul Walker did with interest rates in 1980, 1981, where he took them to 20%. He, he caused a recession in terms of tight monetary policy to snuff out the inflation. But otherwise, if you don't do that, that just runs away. Now, this, the inflation we saw in 2022, late 2021, 2022, it was real. It wasn't transitory the way Jay Powell said. So the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're gonna have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession based on, based on a lot of factors, some of which we, we've spoken about. 
Now, the other half of your question, which is you know important to listeners, is what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it: imagine you're in a an, an Irish pub, and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know. And, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories, and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality: what's actually happening. So the Fed story kind of goes like this: the the Fed, uh, you know, forecasting what the Fed's going to do is the easiest thing I do. It's because it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm smarter than anyone else. The Fed actually tells you. All you have to do is listen and believe them. Now, a lot of people don't listen, or they listen like, "Oh, the Fed will never do that." They they will. They actually mean it. Starting in June uh, 2022, that was the peak, and this inflation is coming down. Now, it's still too high. The Fed's not done. Uh, we're going to see um, at least one more interest rate hike. Um, Maybe, but they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So, um, because they and they, Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, the end of November, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing, inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not, they, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment's going to go up. Sorry about that, but we've got to get inflation under control. So is inflation here? Absolutely. It's in Australia, it's in the United States, Europe. You see it all over the world, actually. Um, even Japan, which has, has suffered from deflation more often than not, is seeing inflation of about 4%. That may sound low to an American or an Australian, but that's sky high to the Japanese. So they're feeling the price shock as well. So it's real and it's here. It means that you know you, you may not like the price but you have no choice you've got to go to work take the kids to school deliver goods use your truck and your job whatever it is you have to do it you have to pay that higher price but it means that 75 extra dollars at the pump maybe twice a week so 150 dollars a week that's 150 dollars you don't have to spend on something else could be concert tickets, a show, a dinner, a new dress, um, a new suit of clothes, um, whatever it might be, you're, you're not going to buy that because you've just spent that much money um, on the gasoline. Well, that means all those other industries suffer. Uh, retailers have lost sales, restaurants have empty tables, uh, concerts have empty seats and so forth across uh, the entire spectrum of, of goods and services. Well, soon enough that results in layoffs, um, some business failures, um, price cuts, etc. And that disinflationary and deflationary trend ends up in a recession. So this is uh, unprecedented. It's never been this high. It breaks the pattern of running it up in war and paying it down in peace. No one roots for war, but they happen. Um, and, uh, and it's worse than that because of modern monetary theory. People say, well, Bitcoin's not backed by anything, or the dollar's not backed by anything, or the euro's not backed by anything. And I say, yes, they are. They're all backed by the same thing, which is confidence. Right. If I think something's money, and you think it's money, and I tender it to you for goods and services, and you think you're confident you can give it to Francis for goods and services, and we have a large enough group, it's money. Right. It can be, we were kids, we did this with baseball cards and bottle caps, you know? So anything can be money if there's confidence. but. Confidence is fragile, it's easily lost, and when you lose it, it's very, very difficult to regain. So how do you survive that? Uh, what's the optimal asset allocation method? Well, the key is diversification. You may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class, which is stocks. And they're all gonna go down together or go up together as the case may be, but particularly in times of stress, they become highly correlated. So having 50 different stocks or ETFs or whatever is not diversification, it's just, having a whole bunch of bets in one asset class. So what does real diversification look like? Well, you should have some, you know, 10 year treasury notes, or if they're a little too volatile for your taste, look at a five year note or a two year note, real estate, uh, definitely. Uh, not so much commercial real estate too soon for that, but multifamily housing, residential real estate, farms, good slice of cash, maybe as much as 30%. People hate cash, they go, ah, 
I don't get a yield on cash. You know, cash is a waste of my time, etc. Cash is, is the opposite of leverage. It reduces the volatility of the rest of your portfolio. So if you have volatile, volatile investments in the wings, cash is a, a you know, it's like a bar connecting to two ends of the barbell. Uh, it has very low volatility, but most importantly, it gives you optionality. The answer is diversification. Everyone goes, oh, we, we know that, you know, diversification. But they know the term, but they actually don't know what diversification is. And I'll give you an example. I run into people all the time. They go, well, Jim, I'm fully diversified. I have 50 stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, metals and mining. And I go, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks or equities. And they're all going to go up together or they're all going to go down together. And the more stressful the condition, the more reason you have to be concerned about it, the higher the correlation. You know, on any given day, some stocks go up and stocks go down. But when you dial the stress meter up, they all tend to move together. You, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Um, and, and by the way, when I when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so... But uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, it's not going to be the group. But, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. But the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very illiquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, someone reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'll come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for 50000 in uh, in the 1970s. Uh that's that's a little more specialized, but there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, but uh, 
um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like what's, what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a, uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a, has seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever, but what's responsible for us only having 62% of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And now you, you, you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I said, it's never 100, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's put, a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home, um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robin Hood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But, um, but a lot of people saved the money, but, but there was a very, there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money. They'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there are help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um so there are late that, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. 
you know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of, uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy, but, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are. As an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Oh, or I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. Well, you, you brought up... Um chapters one and two from from currency wars where you you basically highlight uh, this scenario um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that russia and china would accumulate large gold reserves pool their gold and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the u.s dollar is that the form it would take for you something backed by gold probably and here's why um, and, and by the way when i when i wrote that when we did the war game and when i wrote that russia had about 600 tons of gold and today they have 2300 tons china had about 600 tons of gold and today they have about 2000 tons just slightly less that we know of and they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque so russia and china did exactly what we warned the pentagon about in 2009 exactly which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more um so but uh everyone's like well the chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency no it's not going to be the group of but, but but here's why uh well there are a lot of reasons but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for 50000 in the in the 1970s. Uh, 
that's that's a little more specialized. But there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, etc., uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that. Are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as you know, Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one, and you know, banks are going to be in, in distress, money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a? Uh, is is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a has seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62 percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well. There are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. You know, you you, you listen to number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the 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 numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others that are good. Good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time, but as recently as 2000, that number was 70 percent. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000, is basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or、uh, you know, performing other roles, entered the workforce, and then that number went up. So, I、like、guess it's never 100, but 70 was very strong. 62 is is down a lot. I mean, that's.、Um, About a 14 percent decline.、Um, look, you know, GDP. The standard definition is,、um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus you know government expenditure, like a four-part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That equals nominal GDP.、Um, And if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not.、Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right; there are some early retirees.、Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously during COVID, and just it, it's very well studied and clear that、um, working is a habit. You know, it's put a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit; once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working. We're working from home, or you know, we're just staying home.、Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump, and、uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a、uh, that one was a fourteen hundred dollar check, and then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a six hundred dollar check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out,、uh, I think, a $1,600 check.、Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And、uh, a lot of younger people、uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well, but、um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were de- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money; they'll go buy stuff, and that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, it, it,、um, it looked good. But we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks,、uh, and so you know, a lot of people lost the habit. A lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe、uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and、um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody. But but some, and、um, the other problem is,、uh, you know, because people say, "Wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there are help wanted signs?" Which there are. I mean, I was,、right. you know, McDonald's is paying a thirty-five thousand dollar for an entry level like cashier or hamburger,、um, you know, maker. Uh, with benefits, training, and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for you know、uh, entry level hamburger person.、Um, so there are la- the, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got 
perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who were sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, but none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say, if you're, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's, that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate's almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, when I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's, uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators.